go back to the English French balance between, thing, yeah. but on the political side, because you were also ah. there in 1970, you were there in the FLQ crisis, right. the War Measures Act. So right. you were running an English theater in the middle of when the army was in. But Absolutely. Was so it gave us a marvelous opportunity to give something of meaning to the English community. Some sense of leadership, some sense of cohesion, some sense of pride in being able to produce writers of our own, the Fenarios and so on. In reaction to French nation, the Quebec nationalism? Not in a negative re reaction, but in a positive reaction, exactly. I thought Centaur, if it can, if it can, if it can support uh, the emotional life of our own audience, if it can support them in a progressive way and show them a future within Quebec that is cooperative and generous and open-minded and, tr and, and, and prepared to accept uh, the, most of the, the needs of, a, of, of the French-Canadian community. I mean, when I arrived in Montreal, it looked like South Africa. I mean, it looked like the Afrikaners who were rural-based coming into the towns as a, as a poor proletariat. The city was dominated by English capital, as it was in South Africa. And the Afrikaners, or French, were struggling for cultural recognition and eventually political recognition or through political recognition, cultural recognition, and, and, try, and then replacing that with the national recognition, exactly like the Afrikaner English thing. Of course, in South Africa, the black issue superseded all of that. But it was, a, it was a familiar pattern, familiar situation for me to come into. So I saw the aspirational side of French Canada, and I sympathized with it, but not to the state, not to the point of nationhood. I, don't, I never went that far. So how did you do that? Well, by, by doing the playwrights, by doing uh, Fenario and Rossi and the other playwrights. It's exactly what we could make a contribution to Quebec through our own playwrights. And, and we could, we could, they would be praised by the total community. We could be proud of our contribution. Did it work? Yeah, in some measure. Ah, what we was were, the play uh, in a, Sir George Williams, the computers were thrown out the window? Yeah, and I very was a play in Alan Scarf, and I went and saw it, and oh. Alan Scarf was there. And, and I, because I was at the National Theatre School at the time, and it right. was very exciting for me to sit and watch on your stage, albeit a little chaotically, but there was Alan Scarf, and there was a situation that was being played out on the streets three months before, and I was in the theatre seeing something about that. Well, right. Well, that was the urgency with which I felt we had to, we had to make our mark in terms of original work. And I, and I commissioned Peter Deborah, a journalist at the time, who was teaching journalism, I think still, maybe. He was in Montreal to write a script. But it was a terrible bloody script. It was what was it called? The Great White Computer. Well, we eventually named it. I don't know in its original format. And John Giuliani and I and the cast looked at this awful script and said, what do we do with it? So John came up with a brilliant idea that I play the role of an artistic director who recommends the script to a company of actors who try it out and find it, find it totally wanting and then replace it with a play through improvisation that comes to some degree closer to the reality of what actually happened. And Peter Deborah, bless him, uh, accepted this whole thing. He said, oh, I know it's a load of crap, but you know, go ahead. And, and then on opening night, a remarkable thing happened. The theater was invaded by some Black Panther supporters who said we had no right to be doing a play about black consciousness or black protest on a, on a white stage. But they didn't know when the play began because John Julia had all these animal improvisations going on when the audience came in. So they had to sit through to the intermission, much to their chagrin. And then they stormed the stage and formed this half circle with berets at the right angle. And the one guy made a speech, you know, that we shouldn't tolerate this sort of uh, cultural blah, blah, blah. And then he left the stage, and everybody applauded. They thought it was part of the play. One journalist got up and said, I will not tolerate this. They have no right to tell us what plays to watch. And he got a big round of applause, thinking he was also. So it was a great night at the theatre, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember when we were rehearsing it, actually, and there was a scene between Alan and mine that was improvised, and a little team from the CBC had come in to film a couple of minutes, and then suddenly they disappeared. <laughs> And we phoned them and said, what happened? Well, they didn't want to be there. It was embarrassing to see the artistic director and their lead actor having an argument. It was actually part of the play. <laughs> so I guess we were convincing to a certain extent. Did you like that kind of theater? Oh, yeah, it was marvelous. But, you know, it was an improvisation. Huh? 
so we could do it once. I don't think you can do too many improvs. And it wasn't totally successful, but it caught the imagination. I remember uh, it. You remember it, great. I remember, it. I well, remember the chaos, I remember the... Yeah, the people do remember it. You remember something about the atmosphere. I was very lucky in having a group of actors of that time. I almost established a company in the first couple of years. Dana Ivey and, and Alan Scarf and... Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, Richard Donat and a few people like that. But it never lasted. Financially, it was a difficult formula to sustain. So we eventually went into the usual thing of casting a fresh for every play. But we had some great actors. Errol Slew was a great actor who performed more than any other actor in our theater over the course of the 28 years. He created those marvelous roles in the Fugard plays that we brought to the center. Well, let's talk core so to speak. Oh. Most of us in the theater seem to have had an experience in the theater that hit something that is so deep we never forget it and therefore we want to do it. Moments in the theater that you will never forget that in fact plant themselves for the rest of your life. I remember moments in mine and moments in the Sir George Williams play, The Great White Computer. While I don't remember the play, there's something about that experience that mm. I will never forget that in fact has stayed with me 30, 40 years later. What is it the theater that actually does for you that makes it a viable or important art form? If I knew that answer, I could bottle it and make a fortune. I don't know what it is. I, I know that storytelling is close to our basic psychology and that it taps into the deepest part of us. That's what, and, and, and fairy tales uh, encapsulate our imagination at a young age. And the combination of fantasy and reality uh, continues in the theater. Uh, how it, how it affects us, I don't know, I don't know. I always had the, I suppose, the belief that though we dealt with a minority of people in the theater compared to the other media, the effect on those people was so profound, the theater was so profound. I, it, it taps into the mystery of, 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 of our being and, uh, and I'm glad that there is a mystery and that that will never be re fully revealed. Uh, just as I like playwrights who never fully comprehend the characters they write about, that there's an element of mystery beyond every act of creation. And so theatre takes us up to a, a point of, uh, of intuition about our deepest selves, our, 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 ourselves in uh, who we are in, commun in community with other people. and. Uh, takes us up to that doorstep and reveals something that, that is enduring. Uh, it, I mean, theatre has a religious element. It was born out of a religious element, I think, and so ritual and, uh, and fantasy all play their part. Uh, but I just, I don't know. I mean, I could never explain human personalities. I can't explain theatre, because the two are, in a sense, synonymous. Theatre reveals human psychology in its profoundest sense, in its emotionally most powerful sense. And yes, you remember little bits. I was thinking as you spoke about the moments that I would remember in the theatre, and they are fragments too. I seldom remember a whole production. This is sad in a sense, one should remember a whole but No, you remember moments and different productions. But you don't remember an entire symphony, but you remember a certain cut of notes. I don't remember a whole poem, but I remember two lines from the mm, poem. Mm. But the two lines from the poem will impact upon me for the rest of my life. Yes, I suppose I shouldn't uh, regret any of that. Just take it as that's the, the, the nature of the beast.